Welcome, everybody, to the latest edition of the Inside Track. We've got an awesome guest today, Sean Pastage. How are you? I'm outstanding, Ryan. How are you? Yeah, very well, thank you. And as always, my uh, trusty sidekick, Dr. G. Glenda, how are you? Very good, Ryan. I'm excited for this. It's going to be fun. Uh, 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 absolutely. So, 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 so am I. So, uh, now we we obviously got introduced to you, Sean, through uh, through Bobby and, uh, and and Richard. They said you've got to get Sean on. He's uh, he's doing some amazing stuff uh, in the, in the sort of uh, mixing the medical and the, and the fitness. So we, we we can't wait to wait wait to get into that. But probably the best place to start for us is uh, obviously because you're US based. Uh, a lot of our listeners over over this side of the pond probably won't won't have heard of you, won't won't know what you're sort of doing. So, do you want to give us a quick background of uh, of your career to, to to date and what what you're currently doing? I'll give you what I think is the most relevant <laughs> snapshot of the career to date. I've been able to take the way that I used to treat patients in clinic and adopt it for helping people in a personal training setting, in an online coaching setting. And through doing that with thousands of people, my company, Active Life, has been able to coach hundreds of coaches oh, and okay. hundreds of gyms. And what started to happen was the coaches who we were working with were outperforming all of the other coaches and trainers in the gyms where they worked, wow. both from the results they were getting for their clients and the money that they were generating for themselves and for their gym. Coaches then started to run into the ceiling of the gym will only pay me so much. How do I do this? And the gym wasn't a client of ours. So we would say, well, here's how we would recommend talking to your gym owner about being able to bring that business into the gym, stay there mm -hmm. and earn enough money to be, you know, so everybody wins. Some gym owners would accommodate and ask, where did you learn this? And mm. those are gym owners who would then come to us and say, how do I get all of my coaches to talk that way and to perform the way that this coach is? The other ones lost 10, 15, $20,000 a month in revenue because they wouldn't accommodate the coaches. They wouldn't even have the conversation. Wow. So in doing that, we ended up starting to support boutique gyms and commercial gyms, you know, your bigger boxes and nice. developing their personal training departments. When we started to develop their personal training departments in one example in particular, which is our kind of, uh, what I would consider our ideal client, we work with a Gold's Gym franchisee in a, what I would call blue collar market. Mm -hmm. You know, we're talking median household income under $40,000 a year where they are. And we have their gym outperforming every other Gold's Gym in the world. Wow. On personal mm. training month to month. So the average Gold's Gym does about 20% on a monthly basis of what they are doing in personal training. Mm -hmm. And we were able to do that by trimming their team back, eliminating staff members who were never going to be a part of this culture as a fit, and then being able to acquire the right kind of staff members who would be additive to the culture. We've done it slowly and consistently, and it's taken us – I say slowly, it's taken us less than 18 months to get them to the number one gold's gym in the world for wow. personal training. That so if I can ask you, Sean, because this is fascinating already, mm -hmm. just for the the people out there that are definitely in the main gym owners, mm -hmm. what would it look like if I walked into that gym versus a gym that doesn't do culturally what you've just described? Could you describe it for us? The biggest difference is, is you would meet an owner or a manager who genuinely cares about you being successful as a member of their gym. Mm -hmm. That's number one. We can't work with gyms who don't have that. Yeah. So you would meet somebody there who actually cares that you get what you're signing up for. Yeah. The next thing is when you complete your membership enrollment, the membership advisor is going to have a conversation with you about why you want to join. And they're going to be an advisor, not somebody who simply takes your money and then yeah. collects a commission. So if they believe you're a good fit, they're going to help you enroll in a, a courtesy consultation with a personal training member. Our yeah. goal is to have about 40% of the people who enroll in a given month book that consultation. Wow. That's interesting. The consultation then is going to be with a trainer who 
genuinely understands what's going on because based on the way that that person comes in, there are four levels of trainer in any given gym that we work with a level one trainer, level two, three, four, the different levels are associated with the level of education that they've acquired through our company Mm -hmm. and the number of sessions that they've performed Mm -hmm. and the satisfaction of the clients they're working with. If all three of those things are not in alignment, they're not advancing in their career. And if they're not advancing in their career. And is that fluid, Sean? So if if things drop off, they drop back to a a level three? No, No, if things drop off, they stop working there. Ah. (laughs) And and, and when I say drop off, what what I mean there is people have down months. People have yeah, down exactly. quarters. The, the the drop off that we're more concerned with is their intention, their approach to the process. We're not worried about your performance. If the process is done properly, the performance will be the symptom and the positive outcome. Yeah, absolutely. So, so we're just looking to make sure you're still showing up to because everything that we do is extremely high touch. Every trainer that we work with in your club has a one-on-one mentor from our company they're meeting with on a bi-weekly basis. Wow. They have 800 pages of textbook that we wrote that they're going through. They have 18 hours of video content that we put together that they're going through. They have 996 open book test questions that they have to get right to advance. Yeah. And every single day, there are subject matter expert meetings in our company that they can attend live in small groups to talk to somebody about I'm struggling with sales, struggling with acquiring clients, whatever the case might be. So if somebody is struggling to perform, all they need to do is follow the process and they're going to be able to perform. If they're not following the process, they're not going to perform. If they're not going to perform or follow the process, they're not going to work in that club. Well, what's great that you've done though there, Sean, is quite often, and it's it's a real scourge on our industry, this is, in terms of how we support PTs, because we expect them to perform, we expect them to sell PT, we expect them to deliver amazing service, but quite often what we do is we hire a freelance PT and go, pay us our rent, and, they, and then don't give a, to put it bluntly, well, don't give a shit, well, we Ryan, just allow them to deliver what, what they think is right, and it's, it's crazy. And and potentially even worse, what we see a lot of is, I mean, we, I, I spoke at an event recently and there were about 50, 50 big box owners in the gym who represented somewhere around 200 clubs. Mm-hmm. And after I spoke, first of all, the, the gym owner who I was talking about spoke before me. And so I was really well primed to speak. I didn't know he was going to give a 45 minute testimonial about the, the up ramp nice. of his business. We spoke next. I spoke next. After I spoke, we had 18 gym owners during the intermission standing at our table. Yeah. Looking to book calls with me. And what we would ask each of them is if you have multiple locations, we should only start with one. Let's start with the one where you have the most trust in your management and your personal training team. And time and time again, these owners would tell us, I don't trust my management or trainers anywhere. (laughs) And so we would tell them, well, this isn't going to work. Sean, that doesn't obviously surprise me because as Ryan said, especially in the UK market, the personal training part of these businesses has essentially been siphoned off to freelance where I think, sadly, not with bad intention, but club owners are so overwhelmed with the volume of moving parts that they think that piece is sorted because they're all freelancers. And the thing that I think is a real sad missed opportunity is it's actually the PTs that would get the results that would then drive people to keep their memberships. Well, here's the thing. The gym owner, let's take the two different gym owners for a second. Um, The three different gym owners, the one who understands and invests in their people, the one who has a personal training department where everybody is a W-2, and the one who has a personal training department where everybody is a 1099. Let's take the W-2 first, the the scarcity-minded W-2 gym owner. They're used to their team leaving. It's a transient job. They're like, yeah. why, why would I invest in my people when they're just going to leave in yeah, six yeah. months to a year? I'd rather spend $200,000 this year on equipment upgrades because that's what's going to actually drive and keep new members coming through the door. The training department is a pain in the ass that we kind of have to have. That's the way that they think. Yep. Now, we'll come back to them in a moment. The 1099 Club has said, all of those things, 
And they're like, if you can, if I can just get trainers to pay me a thousand dollars a month, five hundred dollars a month for rent, whatever it is, and I don't have to think about it, it's a line item that I can I can just count on every month. And so I was never making any profit on the personal training department anyway. I had HR exposure in the personal training department. Yeah. I had, you know, all these negative reviews coming in about our personal trainers. So instead, I just outsourced to this other company. They pay me a basic rent or these other trainers, they pay me a basic rent and they they run their own business. And now I can just <clears throat> collect my line item and focus on the things I'm good at. The open, like the, the growth-minded gym owner, the one that we look to work with, is somebody who says, I've been consistently investing in my equipment, <clears throat> in my facilities, and I want to be able to offer a service that no other gym in our area can offer. And I understand that the ROI on that might take longer than the ROI on equipment because I can esoterically define that as people joined, everyone who joined, joined because I got this new piece of equipment that I can push a button on. Um, but here's what happens. The, the reason why trainers leave is because there isn't a pathway to financial freedom as a trainer in your gym that is predictable or probable. So when there isn't a pathway to financial freedom that's predictable or probable, now you're looking at, well, how do you expect them to stay? Yeah. The yeah. other side of the coin is I don't want to give them a pathway to financial freedom because they're going to leave anyway. Well, we have <laughs> exactly. To, the one we, about that. Well, so we have to put the chicken. We, we, someone has to go first. Yeah. Right? I, I, I'm married. I don't know if you guys are married, not yep. to each other or whatever, but was. Was so, so when, when, when <laughs> Brian was married, but just to be clear, not to me. Perfect. But we're so, both separately married, and Ryan's now not married. But yes. So so in a relationship, what I always try to do is be. I try to be the first person to apologize. Whatever the I situation know. was, I, I want to be the, like if I if I can be the first one to apologize, it means that I've been able to because I won't apologize until I thoroughly understand their position. And so if I can be the one who understands them so clearly that they're like, that's exactly right, then I can apologize. And if I can apologize, then I can take their guard down. And if I can take their guard down, we can actually have a valuable conversation. In the gym, changing the payment structure, creating opportunities for staff is an apology. We didn't have this before. We couldn't provide this for you. We do value you. We apologize for not having had it. We want to start to do it. And here's how we're going to start. In the U.S., I advise gyms that they should look for one-bedroom apartments within a five-mile radius of the gym where the owner would be happy with his daughter or son living. Take that number and multiply it by four. That's the least amount of money that a trainer needs to be able to make to have financial freedom working in your business long term. Like this. So... Now, now that we know that, all we have to do is figure out how much money does the gym need to make on personal training sessions as an aggregate. Yep. Too often, gyms are paying trainers a percentage of training sessions. Well, now I'm incentivized as a trainer to sell the most expensive session, not the one the client needs. The gym needs to ride the variable wave because it evens out. The coach needs to be able to know exactly what I'm going to make for performance. So that's the first thing that we set up is the appropriate pricing. Yeah. And then what happens that. is, Sometimes we just make that up without knowing what the end goal is. We should know what we need to earn and work back the way. And that's yeah. both parties. I like that. Well, and, and what I also like about setting pricing appropriately is the number one thing that people say is no one's going to pay that here. And I love to tell them not for what you're offering right now. They're not. <laughs> yeah. We'll pay anything <laughs> if you get results. Yeah. And so, and, 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 you know, these, these club owners oftentimes are looking at the other club. What are they charging? We need to be around there. For $5 more, people will perceive us as more valuable. In, in the town where I live, we just opened our first brick and mortar. And the highest priced training session in town outside of us is $85. Mm -hmm. We charge $150. Wow. So it's nearly double the price. Yes. That's differentiation. And can you, can you give us an insight as to what makes, I understand that pricing model is critical, which has been a really cool insight, mm -hmm. but how does the training uh, with your, what I think sounds a bit like Grant Cordan's sales training, where they have to practice every day. So well, I love those touch points that you've got. Well, what I, is, what's different about the training that gives the extra 50% uplift? 
I've heard Grant Cardone say that his product is no good, but his marketing is exceptional. And he doesn't put any time into product quality. All of it goes into marketing. We're the opposite. So, I just so, like the fact that he's got the academy where you're meant to I practice know. every day, like, which resonates with what you just said about yeah. them checking in with you on a daily basis. So, yeah. so, so, so here's 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 an example I'll give you, and then I'll get into what the education is. We, ha it wasn't even our idea. The gym owner in the club I was just describing ran a survey. Every new member who enrolled, if you were going to work with a trainer, yeah. which would it most likely be for? Mm -hmm. And they give them four categories. And this is a gold gym. So getting on a stage and being a bodybuilder is a thing, right? Yeah. So the four categories were um, losing weight, eliminating aches and pains, mm -hmm. um, and, and, and overcoming insecurity, learning how to use the machines, or getting stage ready. Right. What do you think the order that people – what like what what do you think the most popular and the least popular of those were? Probably aches and pains would probably be yeah. Uh, although it wouldn't be the normal, I can imagine that's quite high up there. Obviously, I would say it depends on the the demographic, but I well, can tell you in my demographic that I would love to say thirty, but I'm not <laughs> uh, fifty this year. In the forty fifty bracket, every single person I speak to has some form of pain in some part of their body that they would pay a lot of money if you could eliminate it. You bet your ass. So that one accounted for as many votes as all of the other ones combined. Wow. wow. Number and two. You know, I read on your LinkedIn, this really resonated, Sean, because I think that you're onto something with this notion of pain elimination, because I don't hear many personal trainers talking about that, but it's so... Um, a, a normal part of a lot of people's lives and they just live with it and it's miserable. One out of every two people in the Western world experiences musculoskeletal pain every single day. Wow. So, so, so now, and, and here's the thing, they all know how to get into a physical therapist's office. They all know how to go to a chiropractor. They all know yeah. how to get to their doctor and most of them have done it yeah. and they still have this pain. So now yeah. what happens? What happens? By the way, number two was weight loss. Number three was learn the machines. Number four was get stage ready. So all of these gym marketing, all the gym marketing, if you look, if you just chat GPT, what are, what are the three things the gym marketing personal training departments sell the most? You're basically going to get a, a list of abs, ass, and ego. Yeah. And, like that's, that. and that's not what people buying personal training are looking for. So the next thing is most of the education for any kind of, you know, overcoming aches and pains for a personal trainer is surface level. I mean, it's, it's like my, my eight year old could take that course and pass it. And it's delivered to you from the same companies who are bringing you CEUs for becoming a glute specialist or becoming a, an Instagram, a social media influencer. And I'm not exaggerating. Those are courses that they offer for CEUs. Yeah. It's, you know, this is the stuff that's baked into their club connect, you know, the stuff that they get on the back end for free, the gym owner gets it for free. Well, everybody should know that when you get something for free, you are the product. Yeah. Right? They're selling your data. They're marketing yeah, your attention to other companies. Our education for coaches is 13 months long as a base core. Wow. So 13 and it's almost 20 hours a week. Now it's not 20 hours a week of in the book. It's about three to five hours a week of in the education. It's another 15 hours a week of going ahead and applying it with your clients. But Sean, this is a problem because even in the UK market, because we have this instant gratification society, they're bringing personal trainers out now in seven weeks. But we don't. We don't. And this is this is where I think people have it backwards. We do yeah. not have an instant gratification society. So we've been taught to believe that we have an instant gratification society. We don't. People have been dealing with not having gratification at all for years. And so they're ready to spend the time, the effort, the money, on, on a long-term solution. What we explain to, what we teach the trainers we work with to teach their clients is not how to get out of pain. 
it's not how to get abs. It's not how to move better. It's not how to look better. It's how to become the person who would never have needed their help in the first place. And that person, in order to do that, it's got to be more than exercise. Exercise I love this. Is, it was all about empowerment, isn't it? A hundred percent, yes. But because you got them there, they still want to bring loyalty back to you, even if they can do it themselves, because you gave them the empowerment. The thing that we explain to trainers is if you have somebody who you say, you no longer need me. I love this. You, you've, done, you've done an incredible job. You no longer need me. And that person says to you, well, I'd still like to work with you if that's exactly. okay. Then, then, then you've done something extremely profound. I love that. And now, and now, what we help trainers do—the thing that most of these gyms, um, I've, I've actually never seen it executed the way that we do. The level three and level four trainers in the club that we work with have the ability to write online program design for a member of the club, and have it be built through the club. Most clubs have the scarcity mindset of as soon as I do that that person is going to start working with the trainer outside of the club. Yeah, yeah. Well, the, the way that you avoid that is you make it easier for them to earn their income mm -hmm. doing it through your club than you do doing it Absolutely. outside. So how do we do that? Number one, we can provide education through the gym to the client that is actually valuable that the trainer would have to create on their own yeah. to match the quality of the service outside of the club. Absolutely. And we can have the personal training manager or the general manager of the club auditing to make sure that the personal training clients are going through that education. Because if they're not, the trainer is not making it important enough. The trainer is not making it important enough. They don't get it. If they don't get it, they can't work here. Yeah, yeah. So now all of a sudden the trainer can maximize their time. They can become a full-time trainer making a hundred, hundred fifty thousand dollars a year from anywhere in the world and still be an employee of your pure gym. Yeah, that's exciting. That's a nice idea that you yeah. can have the freedom, but with the stability. Yes, yes. And look, the the, up, it, the upside is always limited for a trainer who's working in, a, in someone else's business. It just right. is. You're trading upside for security. But does that does that involve therefore other than the education? Do you have to therefore think of your digital transformation? Of course. Help make sure that they wouldn't think that their alternative somewhere else is better. There is, there are, here's the thing. There is a trainer who is meant to be in your gym long-term. And there is a trainer who is not. The trainer who is not might be an incredible fit for your gym until the day that they decide I need to go off and do this on my own. Mm -hmm. And if we do our job and we do our job, that person will offload their entire client roster to somebody else in the club because they have the ethics of understanding where their business was developed. And this, ha like, whenever we talk to gym owners about this, they laugh. Yeah, I'm sure that happens. And then I connect them with someone who did it. Yeah, yeah. And then someone else who did it. And then someone else who did it. Yeah, I love this. Um, and so the, the value there is we're, we're changing who the person is. The person who you know today would take that client roster because you've done something and they've done something that has demonstrated the two of you are actually adversaries working in the same place, promising not to kill each other. But, <laughs> as, 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 but that's because you're not creating a path for them. I love that. Right? And, it's, and, so and, true. And, it's so true. And, the, the market in the UK is literally, will take your rent and then... Mm -hmm conveniently see you as now not a distraction to all my other things and I'll just let you get on with it. And then we wonder why they go rogue and it's not worked. Right. And, and, and you know, um, it, I, it, we have trainers we work with who've been through our education, who are the trainer you're talking about in the club paying the rent. And we laugh about it. Because these trainers we're working with are like, yeah, I'm paying $700 a month to be a, a trainer in this gym and I'm generating $18,000 a month of income. If I was working for the gym, I'd be paying them at least 10 of that, <laughs> right? And, and before they worked with us, they would have been happy to have done that. And had they, you know, if, they, if the gym was working with us, we create a path for that same trainer to get to, you know, $12,000, $15,000 in a month where the gym is making an additional 10 on that. And the person is happy to make a little bit less because of all of the other steps in their business that they don't have to do because the gym is taking care of it. Things like 
Um, I know in the US we have privatized health insurance. And I know that it's different in the UK, yeah. but but um, their workers' compensation insurance, the ability to walk through a room that has a hundred people in it at any given time and acquire a client and to be able to say, I'm, you know, you late canceled on a session. It's not even up to me. It's the gym. You have to talk to the gym. Like these, these little things, the marketing made so much easier. The ability to be an advertisement while you're doing your work in someone else's club yeah. <clears throat> and to wear the same uniform as a bunch of other A players so that people who are in that club look at people wearing that uniform and hold reverence for them. It's yeah. just people would trade the upside of the income for the stability of not having to push so hard to make it. And oh. what's the onboarding? I mean, because obviously this is quite a, quite an incredible program by the sounds of that you guys put in. And it's, it's not something I can imagine you just go, right, we sign, sign today, we launch Monday. It's, I, I can imagine it's quite a significant uh, lead up to bringing these, the, these clubs on board so, uh, to get where so, you want to go. So we, like I said, 18 clubs walked up to our table after I gave that talk in New York, and we only offered enrollment to one. And the reason we only offered enrollment to one is they were the one who had a staff they trusted. Yeah. And wanted to trust. The other 17 were like, look, I think that, you know, it'd be, it, you have a lot of opportunity there. It's going to start with you guys putting management in place or we're not going to be able to help you. So uh, here's my contact. If you make some changes, please feel free to, to connect with me. But they're not clubs I'm going to follow up with because my expectations are extremely low that they're going to do that. Yeah. Um, so the first thing we do is a discovery call. Any club who's interested in working with us starts with the discovery call. They need to understand and we need to understand what they're trying to accomplish. Oftentimes clubs come to us and they don't know what they're trying to accomplish. We both need to have clarity around that. Because if a club comes to us and they're like, I need to understand, like, I want to upgrade my bathrooms. I want, I want janitorial services. I want to know what equipment you think I should buy. I want to know how you would lay the gym out. We're not the company for you. If you're a, if you're a health club or a commercial gym, whatever you want to call it, a big box, we are here to help your personal training department become the shining asset of your club. Yeah. That's it. And we will only offer that to you if we believe you have the necessary infrastructure or inf interest in creating the necessary infrastructure to make that successful. Yeah, uh, Sean, I just want to mention very quickly, when I was out in FIBO last week, everybody's wax lyrical about buying, you know, uh, 250, 500, a million pounds worth of equipment. But when you see what people, and this is people that are just doing upgrades, to all existing equipment. And then you hear what they put in investment-wise to education and growth, and it'll be like 8% of what they'll spend on equipment. Yeah. It never fails to stun me because well, equipment is needed to a point, but at what point do we all accept that this is a people business <sighs> where people's lights are on, but no one's home? We have a well, real problem. Well, a, a hammer strength shoulder press machine has never had sex with a member. <laughs> that's, that's, you know, that, that, that's part of what's going on there. And, Not that we know of. Right. That's true. Um, that would be painful. Uh, the, the thing is this, the, the highest skill set of business, in my opinion, is leadership and development of a staff who can successfully pursue your mission. Absolutely. And so a lot of gym owners never get there and, and they, they see it and they're like, I'm a great leader. This just doesn't work. I look at all of my friends who are also great leaders. It doesn't work for them either. So it doesn't work. Let's just invest in the equipment. And the yeah. reality is you're not a great leader. You're probably not even a good leader. Yeah. And, and, and that might be okay for your business model. Just buy the equipment that attracts the people in the door. Don't even have a personal training department. In fact, go go to as much of a staffless operation as you possibly can. Well, so that's that's the common trend at the minute, isn't it? They're, they're yeah, sort of going staff. Staff are difficult to manage. Staff are a cost. Staff are, and you're sort of going staff done right make your business. Yeah, but, that, but that's, the, that's the amazing thing. But Ryan, Ryan but, uh, something that really I'm happy to admit, and I think that Sean's on the money here. As a previous owner myself, you you come at it sometimes with the lens that everybody's like you. And when you're an entrepreneur, 
you think that everybody's got the energy like you, the work ethic like you, the same motivations as you, the desire that you've got. There's a big difference. You own it, they don't. The other thing, the other thing it is... It doesn't make us leaders. The, right. The other thing there is, you know, beef, like I said, before we take a club on, we start with the discovery call. Nobody buys on the discovery call. We don't even make offers on the discovery call. The whole purpose of that is, do we both know what you want to do? And mm -hmm. then we can decide if we think we can and should or should help you or not. If we don't, we make a referral. If we do, we we offer up another call, which is a consultation, which helps us to explain to the client how we would do it. So think of so call one as us doing recon on them. Yeah, yeah. Call two is us giving them the recon on us. Mm -hmm. And then when we're done with call two, they either believe that we're going to be able to help them do this or they don't. Sometimes there's a call three necessary, but when, when, when it's a, when it's a good fit, the next step is not bringing the trainers in. We're not ready to bring the trainers in yet. What happens is when you're looking to shift culture in any, in any organization, the people who resist that culture shift are going to feel around the edges and look for the weak spot. So they're going to try to talk to every manager in your club. What, what are they doing? They're trying to make us get smart. Um, you know, they're trying to charge these prices. What are they crazy? We're all going to lose all of our clients. Like they're going to push around and they're going to look for the person in management who sympathizes with them and who Absolutely. says, yeah, this is crazy. We shouldn't do this. So before we tell a trainer anything, we have the discussion with everybody who they could press on Yeah. to make sure that we are in alignment. Absolutely. Once and, and by the way, that could take a month, two, even three it months sometimes. Time, yeah. So after that, after that part is done, then we onboard the trainers. And what typically happens is the trainers are um, afraid. And it's reasonable. Nothing yeah. is going to change yet, right? We're, we're still in our third month. Nothing is going to change yet because we're not going to say, so we're Active Life. Your gym owner hired us to help you develop more successful careers. And now prices are going to here. They're going to be like, who the fuck are you? What are you talking about? Yeah. So we, you know, we, we help them come to the conclusions. What would it take for you to be full-time here? What would it take for you to want to be really successful here? Love it. Okay, great. Um, how many sessions a week would you want to do for that? Uh, okay. Well, how much money would you need to make per session to be able to do that? Do you think? Oh, I never thought about that this much. Okay. How much money do you think the gym needs to make on a session for the gym to be able to continue to employ you and justify it? I don't know. Okay. Well, can I share with you some of the costs that the gym has that you may not be considering? Really like this. It's dual responsibility. It's yes. actually a real conversation. Yes. Oh, and we we with... never hide those conversations. We don't tell these trainers enough sometimes of the true costs of running a club. Yeah, well, it's they're not entrepreneurs. They're intrapreneurs. And so they don't necessarily understand that every time you buy a new piece of equipment, a piece of that is allocated towards their expense. Yeah, absolutely. They don't understand that, that your rent or your mortgage payment and your taxes are there's a line item that represents them. They yeah, yeah. think oftentimes this gym exists, whether I'm here or not. So if I sell a session for 75 pounds and I make 30, the gym is making 45. That is not what's actually happening yeah. at all. At all. There are commissions all along the way. There are performance yeah. bonuses for management. There, all of this kind of stuff is going into play and they, they have no awareness to it. Yeah, absolutely. And gyms are oftentimes afraid to have the conversation with the trainer about how much money they're actually making. So they leave it obscure. Yes. We want the trainer to have abundant clarity around why things are the way that they are so that they can ask all of the questions that they need to ask so that they can be completely satisfied that they are in the know. Then they can get behind everything that we're doing. Yep. Now we're working as a team. Yep. And once, once we get to there, we don't have to pay them financially freeing wage off the bat. Mm -hmm. We can say, look, here's your ramp to financially freeing wage. You don't just deserve it because you have a job here. Yeah. But you can you can earn it and you can be there in less than 18 months. Mm -hmm. That should be I exciting. think that's also really important, Ryan, is that we often get these trainers and they can't see any future focus. They cannot see the journey because it's not laid out to them. Well, because there isn't one. And well, often, for most cl clubs, they haven't developed one. They, you're right. they, they either haven't developed one or the one that they have is purely based on volume of sessions performed. Absolutely. And what happens now is you go from like a gym owner thinks if this trainer does 
20 sessions in a week, I'll pay them this. They average 25, I'll pay them this. They average 30, I'll pay them this. 35, I'll pay them this. 40, I'll pay them this. Have you ever worked with a trainer who's doing 40 sessions in a week? They have they have stains in their underwear because they don't have time to wipe their ass. So, so you really think you're getting the best training session they can provide? No. We, we get what we incentivize. And so for us, we stop incentivizing trainers after 25 sessions per week. Mm -hmm. 25 sessions is the top volume bonus that they're going to get. And even that's a lot. It's a ton. And by the way, the volume bonus is minimal. It's a minimal part of their pay. The real bonus is just from going from part-time, which we consider 79 sessions yeah, the average. to 80, and the education advancement. Absolutely. That's and that's where the pay comes from. Because then you're getting experience, and with experience, members will want to keep going. So yes. it's about the quality rather than the quantity, which is totally, utterly shining through in everything that you've said tonight. It's about quality. And Ryan, how many times do we talk about this, about the member experience? Well, it's it's quality and it's consistency. And what, what the consistency is is oftentimes even more important than the quality. It's it's what's the highest level of quality that you can perform at consistently. Consistently not, to get to that. That's yes, great. Not not what is the the rock walks in for a training session. What do you give them? Well, it, yeah. It's not that. It's, yeah, yeah. it's what is the level that you can perform at all day? How do we make that better than anybody else anywhere? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, it's and, still got to have a scalable model to a degree, mm -hmm. but yeah. at the level where you're not going to drop off on performance. And I think that that's the sweet spot, isn't it? Well, if you can find a way to incentivize the team as well as the individual, if we right. do this, everybody gets this. That's what, interesting. What happens now is Rob who's already doing 27 sessions a week and doesn't Passes want to do them more. to someone else to get the bonus up. Sells them <laughs> and distributes <laughs> them. Yet. Sells them and distributes them to another coach on the team because he knows he's going to end up making 25 cents on every session that they do. Yeah, love that. We don't see that enough, Ryan, in, in the UK. No, it's not where people go on holiday and they uh, they tell the clients to stop training because right. they, don't, they, they, they don't dare lose them because they're just like, oh, well, I'm away for two weeks now. Right. Uh, you, you'll have to, here's a program to follow. Well, it, it, it's that there's fear. There's fear that someone else is going to do a better job than them. Absolutely. There's, there's, there's no incentive for them to put them with somebody else, except for mm -hmm. the, the client's benefit, which should be enough, but isn't. And you know, what, what this all boils down to is helping these people become people that they weren't before they started. Because yeah. I, if, if, when I leave town, if I have a client I'm working with and I seldom do at this point, um, I'm giving them to somebody else to train. Because I have no, I don't want to be thinking about them when I'm on vacation. I don't want to be writing you a program. I don't want you to check in with me while I'm at the fucking mountain that I'm hiking. <laughs> right? Like, ch talk to Larry. I set him up with you. He's great. You guys gonna you guys gonna hit it off? We we plan this in advance. It's the thing is, people, gym owners and trainers, they they, they misunderstand what people are buying training for and who they're buying it from. They don't care if you're the best trainer. You should be, but they don't care if you are. They want to surround themselves with people who make them better people. Absolutely. You need, so, so, so you need to become a better person because the person who you can't, you can't imagine right now paying 125, 150 pounds for a training session. But your client can't imagine spending 75. They would think that there's something wrong with it. So you need to be able to think like them yeah. so that they can start to want to learn from you about more than how to build their shoulders. Yeah, absolutely. Just out of, in, just out of interest, because there's some amazing, amazing stuff you talked about, Sean. In terms of, because because obviously your, your background, uh, you, you, you were saying earlier, obviously you're a doctor, um, a, a chiropractor, I think you said. How, how do you go from that and sort of go, okay, I see a massive issue yeah, the, the long, this training the, market to, to create such an amazing program that you've got now. The long story short is I was one of the top producing trainers for Equinox Worldwide before I became a doctor. Ah, okay. and, I love that brand. And, yeah. Um, <laughs> so they, they, they do a fine job. Um, they're they're now what I would consider affordable luxury, but they, mm -hmm. they do a bad they, – they, they fail to take care of their people. If you looked at the roster of people right now who are absolutely – dominating 
in the fitness space, building massive personal brands and, and, and corporate brands, and you put them up against how many of these people worked at Equinox and felt like they were pressed up against the glass ceiling and corporatized, your, your, your jaw would drop. I mean, they, they have left tens of millions of dollars a year on the table, letting their best talent walk out the door. Mm. Like say, we the love in, in sorry, Ryan. Sorry, Ryan. Um, no, sorry. Sean, we love testing people on our podcast and we, we don't mind people's opinions. We love it. Who do you think globally has got the personal training nailed and why? I don't think anybody has it nailed. I think the brand that has it closest to nailed is Lifetime. And I and that's because Lifetime, um, they they provide internal education, which Equinox mm -hmm. does as well. Mm -hmm. They have a manager responsible for that department exclusively, which Equinox yeah. does as well. They they know where to put their clubs. You know, they're very particular about where their club goes. And they create the opportunity for so many different elements of training to happen because of the vastness of their facilities. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and they have a very, very growth mindset around what people are going to pay for training and how all of that's going to work. Yeah. Now, that being said, that's the one that's done it at scale. There are clubs like Anatomy in mm -hmm. Miami who who is doing a great job doing that. There's a personal training club in the UK. I forget, I forget what it's called, this gentleman's name, Matthew something maybe. Um, but he does a really good job. Oh, you're Matt Roberts. Yes. Yeah. Yes, Matt Roberts does a very good job. Yeah, he's got his training facilities in London. Yeah. Yep. Um, those are those are the ones that I've seen that I believe are doing uh, more than most. So am I right in saying, Sean, for the viewers, that what you offer is the ability to uh, m basically monetize the personal training in a way that does not sacrifice quality with that sweet spot and you then help uh, clubs that don't have that infrastructure that you would normally see in a, um, a chain type approach, you still allow the independent to have that ability to professionalize that department without that infrastructure that you see with the chains, correct? You become the infrastructure is what I'm asking. We're the infrastructure. Yeah. Um, for either the, the independent coach who does not work in a place where the infrastructure is in place, we help them. Oh, wow. Um, you or, do independent one-off coaches as well? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why, I, that's why I was saying earlier that we laugh, especially in the UK. We have dozens. And when they're, when they're paying $500 to $700 a month to use a gym free will, yeah. and they're generating $15,000 a month for themselves, we just laugh. We're like, this club would be... <laughs> crushing on me yeah yeah but, there but are there are there are some providers in the uk market that do support personal trainers one-on-one -on -one. what we don't see is what you've done in terms of uh, working yeah. with everybody in there synergy are, together there, there are providers who do all of this stuff everywhere and and you asked me why um or you asked me who has it nailed and i said nobody has it nailed and the reason why i think most people don't have it nailed is there's a lot of unconscious incompetence Mm -hmm. And unconscious incompetence means you think you're really good at something because yeah, you've never seen it done really well. I agree. And and that they're, they're great at personal training. But when I see people who are like, oh, that's a corrective exercise specialist. And I go ask him seven questions. I'm like, this guy has no idea what he's doing. Yeah. Every once in a while, it gets, it gets sunny out and it shines on his dog's ass when he goes for a walk. <laughs> so he thinks he's sunning. Like <laughs> the, 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 the amount of content necessary and exposure necessary to understand how to help somebody consistently, but you can, you can, it can work once in a while, mm -hmm. but to consistently help somebody to eliminate a story about themselves, forget about the pain, the story that surrounds the pain. I, I have a bad shoulder. No, you don't. You have a yeah. shoulder that hurts when you press. Yeah. So we can change that. Love but that. You are not a bad shoulder. What has that led to? Right? Like, I'll give you an example. Uh, a client that we had had uh, this is one of the clients we actually service ourselves came to us because he, he had a quote bad shoulder. 
well, why do you, why do you care? What's the big deal? Why is it a problem that you have a bad shoulder? Well, I, you know, I can't play softball. Okay. Why is playing softball important to you? Do you want to play? <laughs> well, because, because playing softball is kind of my social outlet with my friends. Interesting. So if I'm understanding what you're saying correctly, what you're describing right now is that the reason that you're here is actually not because your shoulders are a problem. It's because you want to be able to reclaim that social outlet with your friends. Is that right? Absolutely. Yes, that's right. Great. Here's a question for you. Uh, since you hurt your shoulder six weeks ago and the physical therapy didn't work and you were told you're not surgical, how many times have you been to softball? Well, I haven't been at all. Why would I go? I can't play. Well, you told me that softball was not actually about playing. It was about a social outlet with your friends. Yeah. Yes. Great. Here's your first piece of homework from me, whether we decide to work together or not. I want you to go to softball this week. Yeah. I love this. Okay. So these light bulbs go like fireworks explode in people's heads. Yeah. They're like, Oh my God, I've allowed this shoulder thing to become my story. Yeah, absolutely. Right. So, so that's step one. You have to be able to identify that and solve that problem. Because if you just focus everything on how do I get rid of the shoulder pain? Well, then you're a technician. You can be well, you know, it's funny adding. you say this, Sean, because I say this to Ryan every time we have an episode because I'm a well-being specialist and I like bringing it back there. But we have all this narrative that gives us the reasons for why we will procrastinate. Mm -hmm. And I absolutely love breaking down those narratives. And I don't think that education in the PT sector has done that well at all. It has. We have purely focused on education that's based on physical or technical skills, how to do a brimming lap pull down, not understand it. Well, they understand, but not given the education to these trainers that 80% is down to uh, the psychology more than the physical. Well, we know that a trainer who's in the corrective exercise space has no idea what they're doing when they say simple terms that they're like, they're, they're, the, they're the, the canary in the coal mine for us. If a trainer says, ease back into it, you have no idea what you're doing because you don't know how to tell somebody what easing back into it is. That person's a professional footballer. That person hasn't gotten off the couch in six months. What's easing back into it? Is it the yeah. same for both of them? Never say those words. Tell them exactly what to do. When they say we can work around it, well, you don't know what you're doing because that person came to you and said, I don't want to work around it. <laughs> I want to solve it. <laughs> when, 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 when somebody, when, when, when someone says, yeah, it's, you know, we're, we're, we're going, we're going to get there. And that's the end of it. You have no idea what you're doing because what I want. We don't know where there is. is. They don't know where they, well, there is no pain in their mind, right? But, but what I want to know is how will we know along the way that this person is making the progress that is going to get them to the end goal? How do we communicate with them about that? Because yeah. if they have clarity around, oh, this is progress, they will actually get better faster. Yeah. So there, there, there are so many of these little red herrings and, and these, these canary in the coal mine to name a second bird. You know, so someone who says, you know, if, if I could help you, would you be willing to work with me? Well, you don't have confidence. You're asking that person a favor. If I said I have tickets to go see, name your favorite brand, you know, would you be willing to come with me? The question is, why are you asking me if I'd be willing to go see this incredible band? Where are the seats? What do we have to do to go? If I said, would you like to come with me? Yeah. Are you kidding me? Yes, of course I would. So there are these little subtleties in language that we catch in people who are who are struggling, and we know it's because the psychology is off. It's just so refreshing, Ryan, to hear someone who is so ultimately passionate about something that I think is a real problem in our industry is the right level of education and why personal training only ever is this small percentage of clubs' money because we've run a deficit model for too long. And it's lovely to hear something so refreshing. I think what would be really good, Sean, is if the club owner that's out there loves what they're hearing, what's the deal and what's the return on investment as far as the data that you've got? So the way, what our stuff costs, if, if that's what you're asking, is that yeah. their first month working with us is $5,000. Mm -hmm. Every month after that is $2,750. This is US. Yeah. Once they, this is for the gym owner. Once they start adding trainers to their account. 
Yeah. It's $800 per month per trainer. Yep. We do not take your department part and parcel. You are either putting every trainer on this or we are not working with you. Right. Because this is a culture that we're developing. Absolutely. Not, not a person. That's what it costs. Um, we are yet to have a club work with us and not be ROI positive by the six month mark. That's wow. interesting. And, and here's why. There are clubs who we've signed up in error who we should not have signed up. And when we realize this is not going to work, we cancel the account. To keep all what, are, what would you say are the top three attributes that make it work? I'd rather give you the top three that don't. Oh, go for it. I'd rather let people, you know, cancel themselves, disqualify yourself. Don't reach out to me. <laughs> um, that there is, there is no management in place. Okay. Right. So, so there's an owner and there's like the person who manages the front desk, the training department, the smoothie bar and the, 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 the gym, like that's ain't going to work. Right. You need somebody who's either the general manager of the club and the personal training manager or a yeah. training manager or someone who you could assign to personal training manager. Yeah. And that person does not have to be a trainer. Yeah. You need to be a leader and we can develop them into that. So yeah. to be willing to do it. That's number one. Number two is a club who is unwilling to shed the people who have been there with them for a long time, but who will never fit into this culture. Okay, cool. Because A players do not want B players on their team. True. So you might have the person like, you know, they might be the sweetest person in the world. They come in, they do five to 10 sessions a week. Then they go home, they take care of their kids. Everyone loves them, but they're never going to do the education. They're never going yeah. to tell. They're never going to perform. They have to go. I think you should tell Jurgen Klopp from Liverpool that at the moment because he's hanging on to people through loyalty. Jurgen Klopp from Liverpool. Needs to now be in the B team. You're not doing them any favors. No. It's, it, it's, it's a perceptive favor that you're doing for these people, but they're not happy. Yeah, absolutely. They, they, they're, they'll tell you that they are because they don't actually understand what happy means through their work. They're, they're, they don't want to do this. Let them go. Yeah, yeah. What's the so, third one? The third thing that makes gyms unreliable for us or unsuccessful is that the owner is looking for a return on investment too fast. They're looking to see, I put this much money into the machine and that much money came out. That's yeah. the metric that they're tracking. Yeah. When, you, when you chase money, you catch nothing. So if it's, it's kind of like being the person who goes out to the pub and just hits on every girl in the place. That's the person chasing money. You're not getting any. No. Like the girls are gonna be like, did he come to you? Yeah, he came to me. Did he come to you? Yeah, he came. <laughs> creepy, right? Are like, you yeah, listening, creepy. Ryan? <laughs> but <laughs> but right, like the the, the the person who the person who's gonna be successful is the one who is just looking to start genuine conversation. You're not looking to bang yeah. everything that walks. Yeah. So so when when we can when we can get a club owner who says whether we make money on this or not, I want better people working in our club and they deserve better development. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're on to something and you're going to make a lot of money. When we get a club owner who says, I have a manager, we just don't have systems for them. And they're trying to create their own systems. So this trainer is doing education around sports because they're good at sports performance. This trainer is doing education for the team around exercise, you know, corrective exercise because they're good at that. This trainer is doing education around glutes because they're good at glutes. It's like, no. Now, if that trainer leaves, you no longer have education around that. And this trainer is good at doing it, not teaching it. Yeah. yeah. So as long as they're prepared to have somebody like, yes, we're going to embrace that the minimum level of education for our trainer is that they can assess a client. They can communicate with the client. They can deliver very clear KPIs and promises to a client that they can keep. Yes, we can be a fit. Uh, we have somebody who's managing and overseeing the department who is going to track the numbers on a month to month basis. And, and and get a feel for the people, make sure the people yeah, yeah. are happy. Yes, we can help you. And when we work with a club like that, we're mentoring that person and we have separate staff who mentor the team. Yeah, yeah. Because it's a and different skill set. 
And is there a sweet spot in terms of the size of club that this sort of program works for, Sean? It's you know what I mean because we've yeah, got a I've wide done. variety of clubs from the sort of one fifty small boot campy style of clubs all the way up to the big ten thousand. Uh, so you know, we clubs. have. We, is there a sweet spot that you guys find if they're that small, they might not work, or if they're we have a different big, we have a different program for the boutique club than we have for the commercial club. The boutique club, it's, it's also a different price point. They're coming in at 5000 for the first month, and then it's $1,900 a month plus $800 per client because their, their fixed costs are going to make up a much larger percentage of their uh, expenses than, than the commercial club is, and their That's upside true. is lower than the commercial side is. So, but it still works regardless of the oh, size. Yeah. Just- oh, yeah. So, so not regardless of the size. You can be, you can be um, too small. For it to make sense for us to work with you, if if, if you're operating out of a space that's a thousand square feet or even two thousand square feet or less, then you should sign up with us as a coach because you're not operating a real yeah 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 business. Most likely, you're operating a job for yourself, and we can help you free yourself of that job and be successful in it. Yeah yeah. Uh, but that's a different program. The coach program is fifteen thousand dollars for thirteen. Well, months. Sean, just being mindful of time because we will wrap up at an hour. I think that we need to get you back on. I think that I could talk to you for hours. Uh, just your level of understanding of this market and knowledge is really inspiring. For the club owner out there, obviously they can reach out to you uh, if they would love to consider external support. But assuming that they don't do that, what's the top piece of advice that you would give club owners right now in the subject of personal training if you could have the platform to uh, really give you know the sean uh pastor's uh mantra what would it be evaluate why you would take advice from me and not want to get on a call (laughs) right the the call costs nothing there's no commitment to buying on the call I'm not even going to offer you to buy on the call. So the advice I would give a gym owner is why would you take a tip from me and not want to get on a call with me? That's interesting. I like how you did that there, Sean. (laughs) It does, Ryan, it reminds me all the time when we talk about uh, the problem in our clubs when nobody ever asks for the sale. Well, there's fear. So Sean still definitely got that commerciality. Well, there's the, what, what it describes is fear. You're afraid that you're going to get on a call with me. You're going to want to work with me. We're going to be too expensive. You can't afford it. And so you don't want to get on the call with me in the first place. We're too expensive. We are too expensive for everybody. We are too expensive for everybody. Until you start making them loads of money and then, of then course. you're cheap. Of course. We, no, nobody, like nobody works with us because we're a budget. <laughs> but assuming Absolutely. assuming some people are very uh, risk averse just wants a bit of good advice in personal training right now for our UK owners right now who are getting the benefit of your years of experience mm-hmm. what would be the top bit of advice that you would give them that could raise the dial even just 1% it, I, I know other than call you I know it's not the answer you want. I'm not telling you to call me. It's I didn't tell anyone to call me. I told them that if they if they want a tip but they don't want to get on the call, evaluate why. So so often often oftentimes what happens here is I'm risk averse. I'm I'm you know I, I'm short on money. It's not the right time. Whatever the case is, that is the path through. So the thing that I would give to somebody as a piece of advice here is if you're risk averse, what's the, what's the tip for you? Why are you risk averse? <laughs> How has how has risk averse served you? That th- those are that's that's the tip. Well, and the they, challenge we do have, Sean, is that there would be a lot of people out there right now, and I'm just being a realist for a minute. I think I want to end with one final question for the club owners out there that are making a loss mm-hmm. and their business is at risk. How do they fund this in the early days to take advantage of this kind of expertise? That is a good question, right? It's a great question. So the answer to that question, there's, it, there's a few parts to it. Let me, can I walk through all of them? Do I have time? Absolutely. No, yeah, yeah, go through it. We've got two minutes. 
Okay. So the first thing is evaluate what you're spending on. What are the things that you are spending on right now that are not generating an ROI for you and that are not on a path to generating an ROI for Love you? That. Eliminate that. You think it's important. It might not be important. You have a group yeah. fitness model in your gym and nobody's attending your group class, but you think it's the reason why people come. Pull your members. Find out if people are actually coming for that. If they're Love not that. coming for that, eliminate your group fitness. Knock that off your payroll. The next thing, are you running a smoothie bar or some kind of a shop in your gym and manning it, putting hours into it and nobody's attending it. If no one's attending, if it's not profitable, it's not a reason why people come get rid of it. Do you have a little weird room where you have an in-body scanner or some kind of a machine that people stand on that occupies space and isn't monetized that eliminate it, start to monetize it. That That's number one. Number two is you certainly can go to something that is working, something people are buying. Let's say that they're paying extra money for your spin class, for your massage service, your personal training. Increase the cost on that by 10%. You're not going to find that your business is going to fall off and you're going to find no. some extra cash right there. Okay. Um, another thing that you can do, stop selling discount upfront memberships. Stop yep. selling discount upfront memberships. Start selling upfront memberships that include things that people would otherwise have to buy that they're not getting access to right now because they don't know what it is. They don't know how valuable it is. Give it to them for free one time on the upfront membership. And now if they want more of it, they're going to start buying it. Have a plan yeah. to turn that person from a free client into a paying client for that Absolutely. service. That's, those are some simple things they can do. Well, okay. I have got to be honest, Sean, you passed the test because Great. we threw that one at you. And uh, you came up with some blinding answers. So for all the club owners out there who really want to get a grip of their personal training and honestly think it can do better than 10% of the club's income, I think that there's no harm in a call. Um, I've got to go shortly, but Ryan, I found this really fascinating and I want to thank you, Sean. Brilliant. Absolutely. One final question we do have though, Sean, and we ask all of, all of our guests in terms of um inspirations now we try and ask people not their families just because every, everybody uh, mm -hmm. quite often the family is an inspiration um unless it's an amazing uh an anecdote but um is there anyone in the industry or someone that you follow that you sort of go that that's a real inspiration as to what 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 i do uh it can be yourself uh we have had one say that so 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 there i'll give you two uh one of them is our team at active life I'm able to not work. If like if I want to go on vacation for three months, no one's going to know. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, they'll, they'll know, but uh, <laughs> but our team inspires me every day. That's amazing. And then um, there, th I have some friends in the industry. I'll name I'll name all of them. Well, I'll name a bunch of them in a moment. And I, I I'm inspired by these people because of how generous they are and how little they ask for in return. And by little, I mean nothing. Yeah. People like Luca Hosevar from Vigor Ground out in Seattle is a phenomenal person who genuinely wants people to succeed. Jason Phillips from Nutritional Coaching Institute is consistently connecting people with other valuable people. Wow. Dr. Gabrielle Lyon is one of the best connectors I've ever met. She's constantly making sure that the people in her life are taken care of. Don Saladino is a coach who works with Ryan Reynolds and Blake Lively, and he has his own program online. That guy would give you their shirt off of his back in the winter if you were cold. Those are just a few of the people who I know who wow. are extremely inspiring to me. And my mentor, of course, I work with a gentleman named Ken Andruco, who has helped me to develop into the person who I wasn't before that allows me to be successful the way that I wasn't able to be before. Well, wow. for what it's worth, Sean, you have seriously inspired me. And um, in the spirit of how you showed up, you gave us two answers there, double value. And I really believe just from meeting you for the first time that I'm sure that that's what your amazing clients have experienced is serious value. So you're appreciated. It's been an absolute blast getting you on. I'd love to get you back on mm -hmm. and maybe some of your colleagues as well. Sound sure. amazing people. So I want to thank you on behalf of uh, both of us. Absolutely. And if anyone wants to get in touch with uh, with, with Sean, we'll obviously put uh, put, put all, all your details at the, at the end of the uh, the end of the podcast, so they'll be able to your LinkedIn and uh, and 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 everything else. So appreciate your time the, 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 this evening, uh, Sean, or daytime for you. And uh, we will catch you again soon. I'm sure. <laughs>